So this is the self-development with tactics. Book. So, this one's gonna be about Seth Godin and his book, The Icarus Deception. And yeah, there's gonna be more after the intro as always, and I'm seeing you. And I hope, by the way, that the audio is fine. And now I'm also having my thing here. But let's actually do this. You know, let's actually have my blankets here because then it is for sure gonna be at least a tiny bit better. Yeah, and I'm also hearing it. It is better, it is nicer, it is cool. The screen is a little bit different as I'm seeing. Shh, it's not supposed to be that way. But yeah, I think we're gonna go just ahead with it as normally. Yes, again. <laughs> I should maybe close it. Please check out the description. Or that description, actually. Because there's a lot of free things that you can get. First of all, there is the link to the podcast because this is actually a podcast and a YouTube quote-unquote show. On the other hand, you're also going to get three things, as I said. For example, the free PDFs of the things that I've highlighted in this episode or in other episodes, if I've highlighted something. Then it is going to be in a tiny PDF. You can download it and print it and share it and do whatever with it. And there is everything in this that I've gone through in this episode, which is pretty amazing because some people like to listen, therefore we're having a podcast, some people like to watch, therefore we're having the YouTube videos, and some other people like to read things, and this is why there's also the free PDF. And there's as well some music, so if you do want to have some background music in this video, then please also check out the third link, or it's actually, I think, the fourth link, but third section, something like that. And there's also just different tracks to choose from, and they're all, I think, an hour long, so, so you should be fine. Everything should be fine, should be good to go. And yeah, enjoy the episode, and I'm going to see you once and for all. And now it is away. So yeah, here he is, Seth Gordon, my lovely Seth Gordon. He's truly one of the people that I'm really looking up to, you know, really, really, really looking up to him. He's definitely such an incredibly cool and interesting and amazing personality and person. And this is also one of the reasons why we're going to go through his book today as a book notes article by the Sivis.org site or by Derek Sivis himself, who's also himself or was an entrepreneur. So definitely also a pretty interesting person and interesting person to look up to as well. So yeah, uh, Seth W. Godin, which is something that I didn't know that he's actually having a middle name, is an American author and former dot-com business executive. Um, he was attending Stanford University and also Tufts, Tufts University and is an author and as well as entrepreneur. Uh, he is having a spouse and, you know, the, the funny thing is and the cool thing as well is that his spouse, uh, Helen Aronson, she's also... An entrepreneur and she's having a bakery and this bakery is just fucking insanely cool because it is gluten free and it is dairy free and it is everything free like everything like literally everything which is amazing because she's doing the exact same thing as, as she just says that we all should be doing doing something for a dedicated amount of people you know for for a little group but this thing that we're doing and we're making is just such an insane and amazing thing that people just have to consume it you know, and then, yeah, this is fucking amazing. And I appreciate that, and I love that, and I think this is a cool thing. But yeah, his background. After leaving Spinnaker in 1986, he used $20,000 in savings to found Seth Gordon Productions, primarily a book packaging business, out of a studio apartment in New York City. He then met Mark Hust and founded Yo-Yo Dye. After a few years, Gordon sold the book packaging business to his employees and focused his efforts on Yo-Yo Dye where he promoted the concept of permission marketing. Now his business ventures, Yo-Yo Dine launched in 1995 and contests, used contests, online games and scavenger hunts to market companies to participating users. In August 1996, Flatiron Partners invested $4 million in Yo-Yo Dine in return for a 20% stake. At Yo-Yo Dine, Gordon published permission marketing, turning strangers into friends and friends into customers and in 1998 he sold yo-yo dine to yahoo for about 30 million dollars and became yahoo's vice president of marketing or direct marketing in march 2006 gordon launched squidoo 
In July 2008, Squidoo was one of the 500 most visited sites in the world. In 2014, it was no longer considered financially viable and was sold to Hub Pages for some money, I assume, but they're not saying anything about that. He's also an, also an author, as I said before. Gordon is the author of over 18 books, and I think at this point in time it is actually 19, but I'm not quite sure. Free Price Inside was a Forbes business book of the year in 2004, while Purple Cow sold over 1, uh, 150,000 copies in more than 23 different runs in its, in its first two years. The Dip was a Business Week and New York Times bestseller. Business Week also named Lynchpin among its 20 of the best books by the most influential thinkers in business on November the 13th, 2015. In the early 1990s, he curated a 10-book series for children titled Worlds of Power. Each of the book's plots is based on a video game. In June 2013, Godin raised more than $250,000 from readers with the Kickstarter campaign, which is uh, which in turn secured him a book contract with his publisher for his book, The Icarus Deception. Gordon was inducted into the, marketing, uh, into the American Marketing Association's Marketing Hall of Fame in 2018. After, as far as I know, he was, um, he was kicked out, I think, two years before or something. So there, there was definitely something. I don't remember what it was, but there was something. And I do just... Notice that I'm having a lot of water in my mouth and this is due to, to nuts. I shouldn't be eating any nuts before I'm recording, but I'm always doing that just because I really like nuts. But I think having some chewing gum might help. And he's also having a really, really, really successful blog. Um, actually, one of the most successful blogs on the whole world because, and I'm going to illustrate it, if you type in Seth, oh, I'm sorry, S gonna do it like this i'm gonna s space e space t space h space and there it is seth's blog which is a pretty cool thing seth seth in judaism christianity and medicine sethanism and islam was the first th third son of adam and eve and brother of cain and abel the only other child or children mentioned by name in the hebrew bible interesting thing Really, really, really interesting thing. But let's actually head to the book. So here it is. The Icarus Deception by Seth Gordon. Pretty cool book. Um, Derek Sivers read it 2013 or in 2013. So it is quite some some time then. But yeah. Um, and it was rated 8 out of 10 by Derek Sivers as well. Which is quite good which is really 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 good because even though like i do have to say there's a lot of books that are rated 7 out of 10 8 out of 10 or something like that but there's not too many books that are 10 out of 10 and there's also not too many books as far as i've seen them with an 1 out of 10 even though this is highly just based on something that's really subjective so so i don't know in which way this is like uh, saying something or saying something that's significant or whatnot um the icarus deception very interesting. Seth is moving from talking about business to talking about being an artist in the broad sense of anyone who creates and ships something daring and new. I love the distinction between the industrialist and the artist, as it helps me give a term for something I, it, I'd experienced. Not being able to relate at all to those who just want to grow businesses for business sake, whereas I always saw my business like a creative art project. The book stays very high level, so don't look for to-do type tips. Yes, this is not really what Seth Gordon often is doing. He's just giving a framework. He's just giving ideas. He's seeing patterns and, patterns and he's talking about them and writing about them. And you can do something with these patterns, but you can also not do something with these patterns, which is, I don't know, might be a downside, might be just a good thing, but I definitely really, really enjoy his writing and his style in general of talking and communicating because it is so clear and so distinct. It is amazing. Like, it really is an amazing thing. And he's definitely an amazing personality and speaker and just person and, and whatnot as such. You know, I really am grateful and I appreciate it that I've found him and that I found his blog and found his stuff and found his books. I'm also actually having one book. I could get it. But I don't know where it is. I'm anyway going to get it. 
So here it is. This is Marketing by Seth Godin. And I've chosen this book actually over other books. First of all, because I didn't really... I just wanted to have a, a marketing book. And at this point in time, when you just... Uh, when you were looking for um, marketing books, this is actually... Or was one of the, the first ones that appeared on Amazon. Um, yeah. Um, the funny thing is... And, <laughs> and it is a really fucked up story right now. Um, I have read this book before on the Kindle. The thing was that I've um, pirated the book and also I've downloaded it somewhere and I found it really, really easy. Like I wasn't able to find any other book by Seth Godin, but this one, you know, this is marketing. And then I thought like, well, I'm going to read it because it is for free then and whatnot. The thing is I read it and I wasn't really liking it just because I've, I've not understood quite a lot of things. Then, um, I think a year later or something, actually, I thought, well, I'm going to buy myself a book. I'm going to buy myself a marketing book, probably because, of course, I could have also chosen something else, but I've decided to just go for marketing because um, I think there's something universally interesting and universally just uh, good to have as well, you know, to just good to have, have laying around. And this is marketing is basically some sort of a summary of all the good things that he is having in his head and that he thinks about and communicates about and all those things. And so I thought, well, I'm going to buy it. After I've bought it, um, I've read the first few few sites and whatnot. And then I thought, um, do I know this book? But I was like, no, I I, I can't. Like, it, it doesn't make any sense that, that I know it. Like, why should I and whatnot? And then I've read and read and read. And I think after like a quarter of it, I thought, well, it must be the book that I've already read. Then I've actually looked up uh, onto my computer or on my computer the, all the files that I've been having. Do I actually have it? This is this is marketing. Or if I've actually deleted it. Uh, no, I think I've actually deleted it back then. I only have the email by Amazon. Thank you for buying it. Well, yeah, please. But then I came to the conclusion that I've already read it. And then I was like, well, um, anyway... I'm gonna read it. But I've actually read it like the first half in a bit and then the second half in a bit. So I didn't read the whole one in, in one go basically. But it is still pretty, pretty difficult sometimes to understand. You know, it might be because of the language, because I'm not a native, it might be because of that. Um yeah, I don't know. It is still a really good book in my point of view, and I think it everybody should be be at least subscribe to to his blog i'd say and also just maybe listen to his speeches and also the podcast the podcast is such an amazing thing um yeah so only good things to to say about seth gordon actually well yeah um is there something else that he's talking about there no not really so my notes and i'm also gonna show you it is far more dangerous to fly too low than to fly then too high because it feels safe to fly low. I do hope that you know the Icarus story and if you do not know it then I'm gonna tell it to you just in a very very brief little thing. Um, there was Icarus and I think there was his father as far as I remember. I'm actually really not quite sure. The whole story is having the point that you shouldn't fly too high because of the sun. You know Icarus is having some or was having wings out of wax I think. Um, which is not really good if you just really fly to, to just close to the sun because they're going to burn and you're going to die because you fall into the water because on the top there is the sun and on the bottom there is water. If you fly too high, you're going to die. But the thing is, and this is something that Seth Godin somehow found out, I don't actually know why, because the story ends there normally, but it doesn't because um, originally there has been a second quote-unquote part, which is, you shouldn't also fly too low because there is the water and you, if you fly too low to the misty water, your wings are going to be just drowned with water and they're going to be just moisturized, but not in a good way. And you're going to die because you fall into the water. And this is what Seth Gordon is actually talking about in this one, that you shouldn't be flying too low, that it is also not good to fly too low. And I do actually have to say, just as I'm thinking about it, and this is something that I've having from Les Brown, I guess, originally, as far as I can remember. It might even be um, Eric Thompson or Thomas, Eric Thomas, I think. It could also be the case, but I'm not quite sure about that. The thing is, 
if you have really big goals, the chance is way, 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 way higher that you're also going to be able to hit a big target. If I'm going for Mars, possibilities are way higher that I'm going to hit the moon. But if I go for the moon, then I might hit some stars. But I mean, chances are there that I'm going to hit the moon if I go for the moon. But, but yeah, you know, chances are also really, really high that I'm not going to just even hit the moon. But if I go for the Mars, which is a really, really, really big goal, and if I'm working for this really, 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 really big goal, chances are so high that I'm going to get to the moon that it is insane, quite. And it's the exact same thing with grades as well. If you do want to have an A um, and you work for an A, chances are way higher that you're going to have a B or a C or whatever, quite. Yeah. We shortchange not only ourselves, but also those who might benefit from our work. And this is actually a thought that I really appreciate that he's spreading this thought. And the thought is that we shouldn't really be thinking about ourselves and we shouldn't really be thinking about what we think and what is good for us, but about the other people or what is good for the other people. In terms of like, should I make my art? Should I make what I really want to make? Not because it is for me and not because I do want to do it, but because some other people are going to be benefiting from that. Some other people are going to use my work to make something amazing or to have a better life. Figure out how to realign your comfort zone with today's new safety zone. Most painters, it turns out, aren't artists at all. They're safety-seeking copycats. You know? And there's actually also a great story that he's often talking about, which is, I think, a city in China where they're painting like 90% of the population's oil paintings. A lot of Mona Lisas, a lot of whatnot. And yeah, commit to the frightening work of flying blind, of taking a stand and making something new, complex and vital. And this is a good part, you know, this is a good way, this is a good um, part of the episode to do this. What is your question? You know, or the question of, (laughs) not not what is your question, but the question of today is, um, what could you be doing? Yes. What, what could you be doing? What could you give to the world? What could you give to other people? What could you make for other people? What could you share? Is there something that you're doing that you could be doing, but you're not doing it at this point in time because you feel like it is maybe not good enough or you feel like it is unnecessary that other people might be benefiting from? And if it is the case, then I highly suggest that um, you do something against it. But please ask yourself the question, can I do something that might be benefiting somebody on this world? And if you can, then why aren't you trying it out? Yeah, let's move ahead. This was the question of the day, another segment of the show, because, because yeah, because I do want to do something different. I do want to have some different things uh, from time to time, and I do want to restructure things and have, um, yeah, I do not also want to be bored myself. Um, what scares is trust, connection, and surprise. If your team is filled with people who work for the company, you'll soon be defeated by tribes of people who work for a cause because they want to change something, because they want to do something, because they want to share something. It's the bridge between people that generate value. Do you think we don't need your art or you are afraid to produce it? Or are you afraid to produce it? The time their employees spend with customers and the loyalty and enthusiasm it generates creates more value than thus the machine in the factory. Yes, being human and being nice and being a friendly person. Success turns turns not on being the low price leader, but on being the high trust leader. Because if people trust you, they're also going to buy from you. Industrialism bought hospitals and CD players and the egg McMuffin. What could be bad about that? The changing culture went further than most expected. We have changed the very nature of our dreams. Our dreams being low, our dreams being like, well, should I really go for them? It's never going to work out. It's never going to be how I am imagining it. But why shouldn't you? And why aren't you doing it? 
The industrialists need to do dream about security and the benefits of compliance. The industrialists work to sell you on a cycle of consumption, which requires more compliance. Because compliance is work and work is money and money is more physical goods. And the industrialists benefits from, benefit from our dream of moving up the corporate ladder, his ladder. Which is something as such that I haven't heard him talking about before. But, but yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Somehow. And it is actually something that I've seen pretty often on Instagram being like, do you really want to just work for the dream of your boss? Don't do that. Be an entrepreneur and, and some shit like this. But no. It, first of all, really depends on the company. It depends on the boss. It depends on so many different factors. And second of all, not everyone is meant to be an entrepreneur. Really not. You know, some, some people actually should be climbing this corporate ladder. Some should. Maybe some shouldn't, but they're still doing it, which is not the right thing they should be doing. Um, but yeah, this is going to be the end of the episode. So I really have to thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I wish you the best health, health, happiness and also success and also hope that you're going to remind yourself and you're going to be remembered, which basically means your legacy and basically means just being a nice person and being remembered as a nice person. With that being said, I am uh, hopefully going to see you the next time. And three questions that I'm having for you are... Why are you here? What are you trying to change? And what is bothering the most? But yeah, gonna see you the next time.